Well, good morning, Encounter Church. What a great start we've had to this day, even though it might be a little gloomy outside. It definitely is not inside. So welcome to Encounter Church this morning. Before we dive in to worship one, serve one, serve one, worship one, serve one, worship one, worship one, serve one, that's going to become the new mantra over these next couple of days and months and years. Serve one, worship one. I want you to get that into your head so that this week as you wake up, serve one, worship one, worship one, serve one. It just kind of comes and goes and goes and comes, and that's the way it's going to be. Serve one, worship one. Before we get in, I want to just pause for a moment of prayer. We have a lot of stuff going on again around our country and around the world things that just seem to be far too much of an everyday occurrence. The school shooting again this past week in Santa Fe, Texas, just got word on Friday, just, uh, just a horrible uh, farming accident in Lancaster on an Amish farm. Some children found their father. Uh, there's just stuff that's happening, and we never know. We really don't know from one day to the next whether we're going to be here or not. And I think we need to be ready and we need to be prepared. The songs that we've sung in worship this morning, uh, I I hope you caught the words on both of them because it it allows you, if you believe them and internalize them, that no matter what happens in your life or in mine, we're ready for whatever God allows and for whatever happens. And so I just want to pray uh, for the families that are involved in these things, for the families that we have here at Encounter Church in our community every week. On our Connect cards, uh, many of you are part of our prayer team that prays for these. Um, there's just a lot going on. And uh, we have a God who knows all about every one of them uh, and is in charge and is in control. But it's hard. And some days are just difficult. And we just want to give that to God this morning. So will you join me in a word of prayer? And then we'll dive in. Father God, thank you for your comfort. And thank you for your peace in times of tragedy and times of sorrow. I uh, can't imagine, again, the families that are going through this again through that school shooting in Santa Fe, Texas. God, watch over them and protect them. Do the healing and the comfort. Bring people around uh, that can serve in that capacity, God. Um, you're a gracious God, but you've chosen to use us to minister to one another, to serve one another, both when things are going well and when things aren't. And, Father, we just thank you for the privilege that we have to serve one another in these times of sorrow for the family that's in Lancaster, uh, for the families of our church that have put on their notes and on their connect cards uh, the things that we need to be praying for. Thank you, God, that you've heard every one of those prayer requests, every one of them. Every one of them is important to you. You know each person individually. You know what's on our hearts. You know the burdens that we carry. Thank you, God, that again, we don't have to do that alone, that we have you always with us and that we have each other. And I pray, God, that you will continue to lead and to bless and to honor. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Well, before we get into serve one, worship one, there is one highlight that I want to acknowledge to you. And you're going to see that on the screen here. And that's talking about June 10th, three weeks from today. We are having the official celebration dedication of this whole facility. We've kind of done little sections time and again as we have moved in. But now that we're in and now that our facility is basically completed and if all goes according to plan, even the parking lot's going to be done by this date, uh, we're going to gather together on Sunday afternoon, June 10th from 3 to 4 o'clock And we're going to give thanks and honor and glory to God for what he has done and to dedicate this whole facility and this property to him. Uh, Special guest, Dr. Craig Sider from New York City. He's uh, the president of movement.org. And uh, he was a former bishop in the Brethren in Christ Church here in the Atlantic Conference. And he's going to be our special guest. He was the bishop that kind of guided Carol Ann and I here to Palmyra nine years ago. Uh, He's been a friend of mine since high school. And uh, he's going to be sharing in the morning service about what God is doing through movement.org, both in New York City and around the world. And then he's going to be our guest Sunday afternoon to share in our dedication. There's going to be a lot of special guests uh, being invited for that afternoon. But you, our church family, are invited. 3 to 4 o'clock, Sunday, June 10th. Mark that on your calendars. We're going to have a lot of historical displays, things of our past 109 years. Uh, it's, it really is going to be a special day. And so I invite you to that now three weeks from today. All right. Well, as I mentioned, I want to talk with you this morning 
and next Sunday on this theme, Serve One, Worship One. Now, I want you to think for a moment about what it was like for you today, this morning, when you drove into the parking lot of Encounter Church. You drove in, you walked in. Maybe you came in through our front doors. Maybe you used the children's ministry doors on the south end of our building. What was that like for you as you came in this morning? Well, I can tell you some of what happened because I was watching and I observed it. When you drove in, there were parking attendants. I saw them through the window of my office. They were greeting you as you came in. They were there to help you. When you came to the doors, you met a greeter. They were waiting to welcome you. There were lobby hosts when you actually got into our lobby. They were there to welcome you and to guide you, to tell you where you needed to go if you needed help. There were check-in specialists if you came through the South Children's Door to help you and your children get settled and comfortable. There were teachers now ready and willing to teach your children to nurture your infants. You walk by some restrooms, they are clean. You came into this facility, it was clean. Once you got into the lobby, you were offered coffee, you were offered tea, you were offered water, and today, of all things, you're even being offered snacks from our cafe team. When you came into this auditorium, ushers were waiting to give you a bulletin to help you find a seat. As you came in this morning, there were lights, there is sound, there was video, there was singing, there was worship, there's teaching, there's been prayer. All before we even almost started the service. In fact, I was looking at my list this morning. There were 30 people on the list who were serving just in the front line, just those to greet you, 30. Some of you are going to be a part of growth groups. Some of those growth groups meet here in this facility. They meet even on a Sunday morning. If you're a new guest this morning, you're going to hear about our welcome center that you can go to, and staff will be there to answer any questions that you have. If you came here during the week, you would find ministries for our youth and for our young adults and groups and children. And the list goes on and on. And almost every one of those people that you met were volunteers, men and women who understand what it means to serve one and to worship one. On any given Sunday, it's between 65 and 75 volunteers that make it seem so smooth and effortless when you come in to encounter church. Well, as you probably know, it doesn't just happen. Now, as you look at this graphic What comes to your mind? Nice colors. I like the colors. We need some of that bright yellow and orange because we're not getting it outside. Kind of makes you feel a little bit like summer, upbeat. When I look at it, it kind of makes me feel good. It's almost like a child drew it. Well, kind of because our graphics guru, Adam, is the one who did it. And he does an incredible job with the graphics around Encounter Church. But as you continue to look at it, I hope you also notice that the one in the center is highlighted. Not by accident. Because both serving and worshiping focus on the one. Because it's always about the one. And of course, I'm talking about Jesus. You see, when we serve, we serve Jesus. When we worship, we worship Jesus. It's all about Jesus. In fact, when you serve, you are worshiping. God's word tells us that service is actually an act of worship to God. And when we worship, we serve him and we serve one another. But it's always about the one. That's why we do what we do. But I also want you to see the dual nature of that word one, because we're talking about serve one and worship one. So on any given Sunday, we have two services here at Encounter Church on Sunday mornings. We have one at 9 o'clock and one at 10.45. And what we're beginning to work through in this serve one, worship one, 
is that you can come one hour and serve and stay for the second hour and worship, or you come and worship the first hour and you serve the second. Now, again, we have many ministries that also meet during the week, and that's just as valid. But you see, our goal for Encounter Church is that you choose as a follower of Jesus, you serve as a member of this church family, as someone who attends from the community that you choose to want to give back and that you choose to serve one hour. Our goal is one hour per week on average, either on a Sunday or during the week. For some of you, you're on a schedule where if you're here on a Sunday morning, you're here for the whole morning. You serve both services. You could be here potentially from 8.30 till 12. Well, you've got in a full, almost a month's worth of serving in one morning. Kind of cool. But it's what we're looking to do is to serve one, worship one. And our goal for our church family is that we choose to serve one hour a week on average. We have a missions team here at Encounter Church. We have people serving not only here then at Encounter Church or not even in this community But we go beyond our borders. We are literally serving around the world. But here in our community in the greater Palmyra area, we have the Bethesda Mission. We have Paxton Ministries. We have the Susquehanna Valley Pregnancy Center. We have the Caring Cupboard. We have Operation Christmas Child towards Christmas time. We have Angel Tree at the Christmas time. We have a lot of different things that we do to serve our community. Serve one. Worship one. I believe that's God's plan for Encounter Church. So this morning, I want to set the context for Serve One, Worship One by sharing with you this morning the significance of service. I want to set out for you today as clearly as I can why this is so important for you and your relationship with Jesus and your relationship with Encounter Church. I want to share with you this morning the heart of Jesus as it relates to our serving and how I believe this impacts everything that we say or do. So I want to set some context for you this morning from Matthew chapter 20. So if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to take them out. You can turn them on. You can use the Bibles in front of you this morning. They're underneath the seats in front of you, about every second or third chair. Page 798, it is Matthew 20. Now Jesus again is with his disciples. It's towards the end of his ministry. He's again sharing with them. It's getting close to the end. So he's sharing with them over and over and over again that the day is coming when he is going to die. He's going to be crucified. He's going to give up his life. So he's been sharing that now off and on with his disciples, those who are closest to him. And we pick up that story now in Matthew chapter 20, and I'm going to start reading at verse 20. So that's the context, and then we read these words. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully in front of Jesus to ask a favor. Jesus said, so what's your request? Listen to her request. She replied, in your kingdom, Jesus... Please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right hand and the other on your left. Let me just pause there for a moment. She's, this is mom. Like, she loves her son, James and John. She knows that James and John, you know, along with Peter, were kind of the three closest to Jesus, and Jesus has just been sharing that he's going to have to die. And so, again, she's coming along now with her two sons and says, <laughs> you know, these are really good boys. And I think, you know, when this kingdom comes, whatever that's going to look like, I'd like them to be on either side of you. You got to cut her some slack, right? I mean, she's mom. She just, she wants the best for her boys. Look at Jesus' answer. She said by saying to them, you really have no idea what you're asking for. I mean, are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? In other words, are you willing to die? for your faith in me? And of course, their reply at this point was, oh, yes, you bet, no problem. (laughs) Eh, Jesus said, well, actually, you will be able to, but that is exactly what's going to happen to you. You're going to drink from that cup. Wow. 
I really don't know who's going to be on my right or the left. That's the Father's decision. Let me continue to read. When the ten other disciples, listen to this. <laughs> these guys have been with Jesus all these three years. People are people, are they not? It says, when the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. Pause. <laughs> they were upset. Why were they upset? Well, where was my mom? Why didn't she come to Jesus and ask, you know, for us to be on either side of him? Or, you know, it wasn't indignant about what they asked. It's just they wished that they had been there first. What if James and John got ahead of them? Okay, so Jesus says, all right, boys, have a seat. Have a seat. And he does some more teaching. And he's teaching the boys, his disciples, and he's teaching you and I. And listen to what he says. You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people. Officials flaunt their authority over those under them. Sound familiar? That's kind of what we do in the world in which we live, especially our Western society. Right? It's, it's how can we get to the top? As fast as we can, we want to be in charge. But Jesus said this, but among you, my followers, my disciples, those of you who attend Encounter Church in 2018, among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. And then look at these words. Look at these words. And in fact, I want us to read them together. I think they're going to come up on the screen here. There we go. Let's read these words together, shall we? For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. Okay, now that you've got it, we're going to say it one more time. Let's do it. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. And then that verse goes on to say, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You do understand that Jesus was absolutely clear about his expectations for those who call him Savior, for those of us who call him Lord. Our calling is to serve one another. And of course, he gave us the best example possible, himself. So let me give you a working definition this morning of the word serving, just for us to be able to use over the next couple of weeks. The act of putting the needs of others before our own needs. The act of putting the needs of others before our own needs. It's at the heart of what we're talking about today, getting and putting the needs of others before our own. Now, I suspect that at least for some of us today, you're saying, well, but pastor, like, I need someone to serve me. I know that you're saying I'm supposed to serve, but I'm going through a really difficult time. It's hard right now. I'm really busy right now. I need someone actually to come alongside me. I need to just come to church on a Sunday morning and just receive something and go home. Maybe you've had a really rough week. And this morning you've just come and you're, you want to soak it in and you've done that with the worship and, and our prayer and our teaching. And, and that is okay. But I want you to understand but there is something I know about needs being met, that when you meet the needs of others, in some supernatural way, God meets your needs. He'll give you the strength, the courage, the power to both serve others, and at the same time, he works in your life to meet the needs that you have. It's the same turning everything upside down kind of teaching that we've come to know about Jesus. Right? I mean, it was Jesus who just said, for even the Son of Man came, what? Not to be served, but to serve others. 
So again, I'm, I'm so glad you're here today because I want you to know practically what this looks like within the church family of Encounter Church. Because I know we all bring something to the table, every one of us that can help others, that can be of service to others. And so we've come up with this phrase, and I just love it, serve one, worship one. See, one of the key factors in our serving involves what the Apostle Paul called our spiritual gifts. He wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. This grace gift, this spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. It's a gift. It's an ability. It is given to us by God. When we make that profession of faith in Jesus, I want to be a follower of Jesus, we get this supernatural charis or grace gift. And these gifts are not something we ask for. It's not something that you earn over time. Again, rather, when you make that decision to be a follower of Jesus... We're told that his Holy Spirit then empowers us to serve in some very unique ways, ways that will benefit first the church family and then beyond. So you have in your bulletins this morning this little thing called unwrapping my gifts. I want you to just take that out. So get your bulletins, pull this little insert out, and I just want to highlight a couple of things there for you so that you can begin thinking about this. Because if you made that decision to be a follower of Jesus, then there is something on this page that you have. And it might be one, it might be two, it might be half a dozen. Some of them might be in seed form. You kind of feel it coming, but you might need some training. You might need some help in in developing that gift. But again, these are gifts that God's Spirit has given to you. And so this is a list that you can just look at. Now, there's tests that you can take that kind of help you maybe analyze a little more deeply. But what we have found is that when you look over these and read them pretty quickly, you'll find out, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that one's definitely not me. Like we kind of know intuitively where we might land with some of these. And so you can see that there's different kinds of gifts. We've just divided them up here for you. Gifts that communicate God's word. There's the preaching gift. There's evangelism, missions, apostle. If you go inside, there's gifts that educate people. So there's a teaching gift. Words of encouragement and wisdom, discernment and knowledge. And you can see some of the definitions that are in here. There's gifts that demonstrate the love of God through service and mercy and hospitality. There's pastoring or shepherding gifts and the gift of giving. There's gifts that celebrate the very presence of God. We see them every Sunday morning. Music, arts, crafts. There's prayer-related gifts of intercession and healing, miracles and praying within our spirits. On the back side, it even says that there's some gifts that support all of the gifts. Leadership, administration, faith. So I encourage you to take a look at this over the next couple of weeks. And maybe just check off a few and just say, you know, that might be me. This might be where I sense God might be working in my life. Because what's going to happen when you find some of these places and you start working out of your giftedness, There's going to be a sense of fulfillment in what you're doing. There's going to be fruitfulness. In other words, there's going to be results. So take a look at it. When you go out this morning, and maybe you saw that when you came in, we've got eight different tables set up in the lobby, eight major ministries of our church that kind of coincide with some of the other ministries. But there are going to be opportunities for you there to take a look at what's being offered. And in fact, let me just highlight some of those to you. Because at those tables and in those ministries... And let's see, let's go to the next one. There we go. Uh, They're going to have what they call first serve opportunities. First serve opportunities. In other words, you've kind of gone through that checklist of the gifts. You've kind of looked at the ministries. You kind of said, you know what, I think this might be the place. Well, tell them that. Tell them that I want to try it. I want to see what it's like. I want to do it for one or two or three weeks. I just want to see, is this maybe where God is leading me? Or maybe not. But that's what a first serve opportunity is. And every one of our ministries has those kind of first serve opportunities where you can just try it. So you can see there we've got the various ministries of our church. Um, Let me just start, well, with that first one, Kids Connection. So that's our children's ministry. Mostly that happens on Sunday mornings. But we've got our nursery. We've got toddlers. We've got preschool. We've got our pre-K. We've got K to grade 4. We've got the kids check-in. We've got assimilation. We've got to make people feel welcome when they're there. All of those areas are part of just children's ministry. So check out their table. Maybe there's something there 
that God is nudging you and saying, you know what, in this serve one, worship one, I want to be a part of what God's doing in the life of some of those kids. So I encourage you to do that. Um, we've got the youth and young adults. They've got a table out there. And most of that ministry takes place during the week on Mondays and Tuesdays and Thursdays. And there's all kinds of opportunities. If you see the youth thing, they've got a pegboard set up there where you can just pull off one of those tabs, kind of like a number when you're going to the deli. Well, this is kind of the same kind of thing, but it's that youth ministry. And you can pull one of those off and say, that's what I want to try right there. And they'll help you to get connected. Uh, what do we got? We got the worship and the tech ministry. And you can see that, what it takes on a Sunday morning from audio to design to the IT stuff that we have going on, video, PowerPoint, worship, so many different things. Check out their table. It's just actually right behind this wall. They've got some cool techie things. You would expect that uh, from that worship ministry. And so take a look at that. We've got our front line. Oh, my goodness, Frontline. I told you that we've got 30 different people on that just this morning. And Frontline is, is our greeters. It's, it's the cafe and hospitality. It's those who work in the parking lot. You saw that? You get that really cool vest. You get a little radio that clips over here, and you start talking like this. You look like somebody that's really important. You all know that's for me. I mean, some Sunday when I'm not preaching or teaching or emceeing, you might see me in the parking lot because I just think that's the, uh, that's the coolest thing. Um, we've got ushers. I mean, if you can smile, this whole front line team is for you. Just to make people feel welcome. You know how important it is for you when you come in to be made to feel welcome from the parking lot to when you get in here and when you leave. Because that's what the family does. We make each other feel welcome. This is a place where people can belong. And maybe once they feel like they can belong, they might learn to believe and then become part of the family of God. So it's important. So great opportunities. What else do we have up there? Uh, facility management. We've got stuff that's going on here during the week on Sundays. Uh, it has to do with caring for this facility, um, doing the repair ministries that are taking place on a regular basis here. But we're also looking to try something new here at Encounter Church, and that kind of falls under that, and you'll see it at their table. Uh, and that is putting together some kind of a professional directory. Our church is large enough that we have men and women, those of you here who are part of various professions, that why wouldn't we put them together in some kind of a catalog so that if we have a need of this or that or the other thing, that we know that there's people within this church family that could provide that need, not for free, but that we would know that they're fair and that they're not trying to rip us off, but they're part of this church family. And so take a look at that table, and they'd be glad to talk with you a little bit further about that. Our prayer ministry uh, is another significant thing for us here at Encounter Church. We have our new prayer team room. And in fact, in two weeks, on June 3rd, we're going to be dedicating that room, and we're going to have a prayer panel up here. Pastor Amanda's going to lead us in that. That's going to be in this, just an awesome day. They have a table. Uh, out in the lobby. So I would encourage you to take a look at that too. Our missions and growth groups, and I've talked a little bit about them already this morning and you've heard those announcements. Uh, take a look at their table. Men's and women's ministries, exactly the same thing. How we're trying to nurture and care for the families of our church, for the men and the women as couples, in marriage, as singles. Uh, what does that look like for us? Uh, so take a look at their tables as well. And as I've mentioned to you where I'm going to, uh, all of those tables have snacks. Now what I did realize is that some of our ministry leaders weren't thrilled with the snack they got. So I was told that sometime in between these services or while we're in service, they're going to be switching those around because some wanted this and some wanted that. We have, it's, it's pretty competitive there for our ministries. So just be careful as you're walking around because they're going to be coming after you and uh, getting you to sign up. No, not really. But there are snacks at all of those tables. So if you want a little bit from each one, you, all you have to do is sign up at every one. No, that's not true either, but it, it just, it's just important. Uh, and in fact, this little booklet that I'm uh, holding that I was just uh, doing some of that ministry from, uh, those are available at all the tables as well. And so make sure that you pick up those and see what's happening. Okay, coming to the end. And it brings us to the final scripture that I want to share with you this morning. So again, if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to turn now to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians, you can see that on the screens, page 958, a very well-known passage from the Apostle Paul. He's speaking to the church in Philippi. But this chapter, in chapter 2, and especially verses 5 to 11, 
kind of are at the core of the attitude of Jesus that we're talking about this morning, and I want you to hear it from the Apostle Paul himself. Apostle Paul writes these words about the person of Jesus Christ. And we're going to start verses, uh, actually at verse 1 of chapter 2. Again, this kind of helps us set the context. Because what you're going to find here is that these words are kind of, again, twofold. They're, they're for the church, so they would be like for Encounter Church. This should be kind of the attitude of Encounter Church. But also digging down where it's the attitude that we need to have individually. So it's, it's a both and for the church and for us individually. So look at what the Apostle Paul writes uh, in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Jesus? Is there anything good that's going to come out of being a part of a church family in Jesus? Any comfort? I mean, it's almost like rhetorical questions. You understand that. I mean, it's like, yes, yes, yes. Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one another, with one mind and one purpose. Talking about the unity of the family of God, that we're moving in the same direction. And so we've given you this mantra of serve one, worship one. It's, it's where we want to go together as a church family. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of others as better than yourself. See how counter, just so counter-cultural Jesus was 2,000 years ago, and it's exactly the same today because people are exactly the same. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Serve one, worship one. Then we go to the next section, beginning at verse 5. And here's where it really hits home. He says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. For claiming to be a church family under the leadership and headship of Jesus, then we are to have the same attitude. And again, we've talked about the fact that in the culture in which we live, there's this upward mobility that tries to push us to the top. But I want you to hear the attitude that Jesus said should exemplify his church and his people. It goes in the other direction. Though he was God, Jesus, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. You know, we live in a world where it's all about getting. Jesus said, no, it's really about giving. The world says, serve me. I'm entitled, serve me. Jesus said, no, my people do it different. We serve others. It says, when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Do you see how he goes from heaven to to being a human being, that was quite a decision to go downward. But you also need to understand that in the culture and the day in which this was written, to actually choose to allow yourself, and in this case, to be crucified, was as low as a person could get. There was no worse way to die and to be humble than to die the death on a cross. And it says this, therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor, and gave him the name above all other names, and that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Human beings, we're kind of messed up. 
we, we don't always get it right. Very seldom do we get it right, it seems like. And having this attitude of service, of humbling ourselves before others, it just seems to go against the grain so often. How do we do that practically, living out the attitude of Jesus? C.S. Lewis wrote in his really incredible little book entitled Mere Christianity. He just gives a little illustration in there, and he says, fallen sinful people, you and I, if we're really serious about trying to be like Jesus, he said, then do what kids do. Pretend. I found that interesting. Just pretend to be like Jesus. You know, kids play that game. I'm going to pretend to be so-and-so. We saw that yesterday, and Meghan Markle became now the princess, the duchess of Sussex. Being a Canadian also by birth, that, that was kind of a cool day. We actually did watch some of it, Carol Ann and I. We thought that was kind of cool. Pretend. You know the craze, well, this was decades ago probably, that WWJD, what would Jesus do? That kind of made some people nervous for a while because they kept, oh, man, would Jesus do this? Would Jesus do this? And sometimes we had the whole wrong idea of Jesus. Because, <laughs> yeah, Jesus would do a lot of those things. He enjoyed life. But C.S. Lewis just said, pretend to be Jesus. So in those cases, just have it go through your mind. Okay, if Jesus was in this situation, how would he respond? How do I think Jesus would handle this? How would Jesus respond to this person? How would Jesus respond to that person? Try it. Just try it. You might like it. Well, you might not because it might make you nervous or anxious or actually have to change. <laughs> but try it. You might like it. I want you to listen. Brock's going to put music to what we've just been talking about.
behind this microphone Good time in darkness shines the brightest And the least I may most, the last I may first We are the Oh, yes, get busy serving. conclude this morning, I want to simply remind you one more time about our theme, Serve One, Worship One. You have nothing to lose. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain when you choose to have the attitude of Jesus who came to serve and not to be served. So we're going to close this morning by simply praying our memory verse for today. Will you please stand with me and we're going to just read this together. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Will you read these words with me this morning? For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Amen. And you may be seated. Oh.